Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater here. This is Athletics Athletics Chat 105. The good-looking gentleman on the top, that's Stuart Weir. He's our senior writer for Europe. He's in Brussels. I'm in the Laren Hall in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. And my name is Larry Eater. Can you believe it? Okay. Stuart, good to see you, my friend. Hi. Here so we tell are me again. about the shot put. Tell us about the shot put today. Well, yes, I have been to the shot put and Chase Ely won, but she made it interesting. She didn't take the lead until the fifth round. Mm. She said she'd been ill since Budapest and uh, struggling really to find her rhythm. And the funny thing oh. was, Larry, I, I saw her back yeah. at the hotel carrying a shot. Yeah. She'd been to <laughs> dinner with a shot. And she wow. sort of saw me looking at her and she said, oh, I forgot, I forgot that I had it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> the best thing about the shot, if I may say so, was yeah. that there wasn't a special media enclosure. We were with the VIPs okay. and there was free Ooh. glasses of wine. Oh, my gosh. It, it, were you able to enjoy a glass of wine or two? I had two glasses of wine while watching the shot put. And uh, I still managed to write you a little report on it. So there we are. That is wonderful. Well, it's the ability for you to work and multiple tasks at the same time that makes you so talented, Stuart. And, and what? how many meets is this, this summer for you now? 16? Well, I've done 10 Diamond Leagues, 16 and all. And you've been away 53 nights? That's right. Your your lovely wife must really care about you. So, you know, yes. I think that's... Well, I'm just more worried how she'll how it'll work when I'm back all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a... a a wonderful world championships. Let me close my yes. window as my neighbor bring the trash in. And it was quite warm. I'm finally enjoying some cooler weather now. We had a, my first week back here was just like Budapest. Yeah, there was, uh, I can't find anything really to fault the world champs about, except that there was a dearth of elevators. And uh, yes, we walked everywhere every day and probably went up 40 flights of stairs, you know. And uh, the, the, uh, the reason. The reason that there are no elevators is that the top tier of the stand or the bleacher where we sat will not be there next year because wow. it's only up temporarily just for this, this event. Yeah. Um, so, well, so why put in an elevator if you're only going to have it ready, use it for two weeks? Although it was certainly hard. I mean, uh, did I mention it was 115 steps up? I think I might have wow. I think you have. I think you have. Well, you know, so it's interesting. Um, Sepp Kohl, our illustrious president, said that he had told the Hungarians that he thought they should consider bidding for the Olympics. That's what I heard, too. Uh, and it sounds like they may actually take it seriously and bid for 2036, which could be very interesting. I also heard they're bidding for the European champs. Have you heard anything on that one yet? I could well be. I mean, they, they, they would get that without any question. Yeah, I thought. I just thought the trying to explain to our readers the quality. Well, first of all, the crowd was into it every day. We yes. had good, healthy crowds in every session. And no matter whether it was hot or not, the tickets were priced so that families could show yeah. show up. Yes, and uh, and they had great crowds. And then the way they did the medals, so people. So say you brought your family the night before, you could come back and enjoy the medals the next night for free. And that was really great. And they had five to 10,000 people there. So yeah. it, I just thought they did a great job, you know. And, yeah, uh, and on the tickets, another thing that I found out was that last year they had um, a massive mass entry fun run. And anyone who competed was able to buy tickets half price. Wow. And what a good marketing thing to do. Yeah, now, I know Jewel, that because my nephew lived there, um, did oh, wow. the fun run, and uh, was buying half price tickets. Well, how does he like living in Budapest? Uh, very much so. I mean, like he said to me, I don't earn as much as I would in London, but the cost of living is so much less that I've actually uh, better off. Yeah. That's what I, I mean, I thought that the, when I talked to people, everybody seemed, to be able to afford things, they were, I mean, Hungary has the highest inflation in Europe. It's at about 10%. Wow. 
most of Europe's about five, U.S. is about four and a half. And, and, and they're in a very interesting place because you've got Ukraine, you've got Romania, you've got Russia, you've got Turkey. And on their St. Stephen's Day, they didn't have anybody from NATO or the European Union. They had Erdogan. They had, you know, it was really interesting, the people that he brought in. But he was very much behind the world champs. He wanted to do that and to show off Hungary the, to the world. And I think they were successful with that. Yeah. You know? And uh, the um, one of our writers, Elliot Denman, went back and looked at the number of medals home countries have taken at the world champs since 2003. And Hungary was, you know, most countries get one or two, you know, home countries. So they did actually pretty darn well, you know, and they had some good performances. And, uh, so, and, and the gentleman who was in charge of the event, Martin, Martin July, his dad was with the IAAF for a long time. And Martin, I believe, is a two-time Olympian in the bobsled. Um, yes. Yeah, he's now um, taking over for World of Athletics and managing their events. And yes. I think he's a great guy. So I'm really happy to see Excellent. that. Yes. Excellent. Seeing a fellow Hungarian uh, uh, mm. pick up some, you know, uh, mm. credentials. How was how was Zurich? I love Zurich. I think it's always a great meet. You know, the, the meet director at the press conference says, if you call your meet the world class meet, you have to achieve a high standard. And I think they always do. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I thought that uh, the competition was a high quality. I love the way the media operation is run. Uh, I mean, for example, I wanted to interview a wheelchair athlete. They hadn't thought about this but they find a way of doing it. I think they're great problem solvers. Uh, there's a glass of wine for the media at the end of the competition. They come around with candy bars during the, the meet just to keep your energy levels up. Always yeah. a very high quality field. And something I went to, which I'll write up for you at some point, was it was a really interesting workshop with um, Nia Ali and Henri de Grasse talking about being parents while still competing. And I mean, wow. Nia said that her children were going back to school the week that she was in Budapest. So she yeah. was scheduling each day um, when she was going to practice and when she had to speak to a teacher on Zoom. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so no, that's, that's, uh... that was really interesting. And... Uh, you know, how they manage their, manage their life with three children. Yeah, um, I saw Nia one night, uh, I think on night eight, when I was going into the stadium, she was with one of her little ones, and the kid was dressed to the nine. I mean, because mm -hmm. I remember her saying that they're all mm -hmm. excited about it when they go to track meets and how they dress and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she had one with her and mm -hmm. just told her how much I enjoyed her com competing and introduced myself. Yeah. She's always very sweet. Yeah, and Andre's... You know, Andre's always very cool. I mean, he, you know, it's uh, Canada did fantastic. I mean, yeah. you know, Canada yeah. and Great Britain were great mm -hmm. stories on the yeah. on the champs. Actually, Larry, I, I can add to your story because Nia said that when it comes up at Easter, the children start asking her, so um, where are you competing this summer, Mom, that we can come with you? <laughs> Which country are That's we going crazy. to this time? Wow. The crowd in Veltklasse. Let's kind of explain this to our readers. They buy tickets months ahead of time, so the place is sold out. And mm -hmm. businesses in um, Zurich buy tickets for their employees. Mm -hmm. It's a gift to them, and it's a huge party. And yeah. they always end with the women's four-by-one, yeah. which is always an exciting one because there's a lot of European teams. Mm -hmm. And this one was pretty darn good. It was like an imitation of uh, Budapest in the mix zone, uh, mix relay with mm. uh, the kid going down at the end. But what was interesting too to me was a Mujinga Kambunji, European mm. champion, Swiss mm. superstar. She has had trouble all year. Yeah. And she was able to double and do quite, I mean, she had seasonal bets. She did. She did. Both yeah. events. And, and I really yeah. like Mujinga. Yeah. She, she always shows class. You never see her get angry and, no. and um she handles it well mm. and her her little sister um mm. Titi, Titaji, is that how yes. you said yes yeah she's i mean 1247 is uh pretty he's improving tough. 
Yeah, yeah, she's looking yeah. good. So, I mean, yeah. the, the as we said in the the hundred mm -hmm. hurdles is one of the toughest events, men or women in track and field. Yes. You know. Yes. And, and again, um, on that, you know, a lot of people were surprised that Danielle Williams won it in Budapest, and so I think she enjoyed going out in Zurich and winning again just to show them. Yeah, she looked great. Her timing was just like wow, yeah. you know, and the confidence yeah. obviously from mm -hmm. Budapest. Um, I I asked her in the presser in in Zurich. I said to her, I was pretty much in line with the finish in Budapest, and I had no idea who had won. Did you know? And she said, I knew I had run well. I was pretty sure I was in the medals, but actually not until it went up on the note, on the scoreboard did I know I'd won. It was so close. I thought, you know, it was like I looked at that one and the men's. 400 you know i was hoping yeah. vernon norwood would get a medal because vernon yeah. i just love vernon he's just a nice yes. guy yes um, yes it was great to see matthew run so well matthew hudson smith yeah big deal for him to be able to put it all together and um the young jamaican wow mm -hmm. but um i did talk to lance uh brownman mm -hmm. after the rate of in, Bu in the airport in Budapest. And I asked him what his biggest surprise of the meet was. And he's, you know, he mentioned our favorite 400 meter record holder. And um, he brought up the quote you got from him in the story you did back in June, where he talked about with uh, Wade that getting the physical stuff back was one thing. Yeah. But as part from it has been the mental. Yes. And yeah. he's been having anxiety attacks, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he had one in the first round. He had one in the semi, and it looked to me when he hit the two hundred, he shut down. There yeah. was nothing mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. That is something we mm -hmm. yeah. don't take into consideration. I remember um, in Will Kateer when I got to interview him in two thousand fourteen. He told me how terribly tough it was to come back from being injured. Yeah. And he was at that time about David Rudisha coming mm. back, you know. Mm. David had had some injuries. And I don't think we – what I was trying to do when we were writing during the World Champs is let our readers understand, one, to make it to the World Champs is one thing. It, it's incredible. One thousand yeah. nine hundred nine. Or athletes when you've got yeah. millions running and jumping and throwing around the world. And then yeah. we wanted the final nine to 12 in the final it means you're the top dozen in the world. Mm -hmm. And then to go from there mm -hmm. and do a medal, like, you know, Fred yeah. Curley, not make the final. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Fred used to let a word when he was asked what happened. And he said, I effed up. And, you know, he still doesn't really know why. He ran a good relay, but he just wasn't there. And that 100 was one of the men and women's were two of the highest class races I've yeah. ever seen in sprint in my yeah. lifetime, yeah. you know? Yeah. Did you get to sit in on um, either the 100 or the 200 pressers? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, I went to the 200. And I got to, it was really funny. The announcer saw me cause, and he mm. goes, you're allowed one question. And I said, what? He goes, everybody's allowed one question. Cause you know, I would, you know, you know what I do? I ask five questions right away yeah. because yeah. no one else is right. Yeah. And sure. I got a question with, with Noah. And um, I asked Noah about how he felt during the 200. Was there any pressure on him after he had done so well in the hundred? And I took that theme with when I uh, spoke to uh, Shakari, and mm -hmm. I asked Shakari, um, you know, you won the a medal in the hundred, medal in the two, and how are you feeling? And she was so relaxed. I had never seen her like that before. And Sharika and her and uh, Sharika, Shakari, and Gabby, it was just a love fest, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. there were um, media people doing two things: one, trying to build up the rivalry between the U.S. and Jamaica. Because, you know, in the past, there's been, yeah. it was yeah. like, I'm over at the, and Shakari yeah. just, look, 
I really like these girls. When we compete, we really compete. And then Sharika threw in, yeah. And mm -hmm. if I'm on that that four by one team, I want my four by one team to win. And it was fun. It was not mean or anything. And they really were careful with that. And mm -hmm. Sharika was asked a question about Flojo and the record. And she took a second to think. And Sharika's always good. You've done some nice pieces yeah. with her. And mm -hmm. she just said, look, Flojo has the world record. She never tested positive. That's the world record. I got to try to beat. And just left it at that. There was a there was a, a media gentleman who is now from Israel. I believe he's Russian. He's emigrated. The guy's been around for a thousand years. And he always he has this great gravelly voice. I love hearing him talk. But he always has those questions, you know, those ominous questions. Mm -hmm. And uh they didn't go for it. No, but it was it was um did you go to any of the pressers that World Athletics did after the events this time, Stuart? No. You I were just found the days. I found the days for too long. Yeah. No, I, I went down. I did both 200s. I did the uh, pre-event with Seb. Got to ask him a few questions there. Uh, Deji did a lot, and we've been putting up some little bits. Did you find the mix zone more cumbersome this time than in the past? No, I thought it worked well. Um, there was a problem at one stage that once you've done broadcast, there's the written press, then right. there's the non-rights whole, there's the PIs. I'm not quite sure what that stands for. It's one category of non-rights holders, and then there's a further category. And at one stage, some of the written press were speaking to an athlete and then following them around and getting in again with the non-rights holders. And that's wow. where I was operating. Uh, yeah. But we mentioned this to World Athletics, and they sorted that out and put up notices and controlled it better. I thought it worked very well. Always either Tanya, Martina, or Zacharias from World Athletics there start solving problems. And I think they're all great people. So for me, it worked very well. No, I think World Athletics team is fantastic. And um, there is a, um, in the media center, I met a woman named Suzanja from um, the Czech Republic. Yes. And she had met me two or three championships back. And I said, I go, I go, Susanna, was I grumpy to you? She goes, oh, no. And I said, okay, I just want to make sure, you know, because I have my moments. They were, what, what people don't understand is that for these media centers to work well, there's yeah. people there constantly sorting issues out. Yes. And the volunteers, were great in the media area where we yeah. were, the Tribune. I did find it funny this time that the U.S. was the farthest out in terms of where media was. Normally, you know, we're a little better places. Or I like to be really high up so no mm -hmm. one can bother me, you know. So you always know where I'm at and you find me. But mm -hmm. uh, there's people I just kind of like to let, let me alone so I can work. We had great seats. The stadium, I don't think there's a bad seat in the place. I we think that's the thing about new, about new build stadiums that, 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 I mean, like, I have a slight mobility issue. And so I asked to be at the end of a row. But my, it wouldn't matter where I was because there was so much space. It's perfectly easy to get in and out from any seat. I had a little incident on the second, third night. It had been a long night, really hot. I was getting a little grumpy. I had mm -hmm. Dave Hunter next to me and uh, Justin on the other side. And I see these three young guys crawl under the tape and sit down and they're watching stuff. And then I figure out they're Irish. They're cheering on the young 400 meter runner, but I don't recognize one of the guys. And I just go to him, Hey, are you media? And he goes, Oh, I'm the team captain. And I look at his badge and it's Robert Heffernan, the race walker. And I walk over to him and I go, Robert, I'm sorry that I was grumpy. I said, I wrote about you in 2007, in 2008, and heck, in 2004. I said, why haven't you gotten older? And he just started laughing. And so we chatted a little bit. He mm -hmm. told me who the top kids were on the Irish team. It was really fun. But he's uh, – and he gave me a little bit of insight into where the walks are now, you know. But uh, what a um, what a modest individual and what an incredible athlete, you know. The guys used to do the 50k are pretty uh pretty tough so that uh 
What was your favorite event in Budapest? Did you have a favorite event? Oh, that's a hard one, isn't it? Um, or break it into categories. What was your favorite Brit uh, event with British athletes? I suppose it was great to see KJT winning the heptathlon because she'd had so many ups and downs and injuries. And uh, she herself said at that time she thought it would never happen again. And, you know, just the character to do a PR in the last two events. You know, mm -hmm. when you thought that Anna was going to come back at her. Yeah. So she goes out yeah. and runs two PRs. So that, that that was that was great because, I mean, I, th I think we had her down for a medal, but probably not uh, a gold. And, I mean, J Josh Kerr uh, loved, loved him. I've spoken to him several times this, this year. He's very amenable. I mean, I had a lovely, a lovely incident with him in Zurich when I wanted to speak to him after his race in Zurich, and he just sort of said to me, I'm sorry, I'm throwing up, I can't speak, but I'll come back <laughs> if I can. And five yeah. minutes later, I heard a voice calling my name, and he had come back to do the interview. I mean, not a lot of athletes would do that. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was tremendous. And, you know, good and in the piece I wrote for you, I thought it was really interesting how he talked about the sacrifices. And, you know, that people think, oh, you've just gone out and won a medal. But actually, he would say, you know, I left home when I was... 17. I I went to Albuquerque and I was too young to sign the form, so my parents had to come with me. Uh, I haven't seen my family much over the years. Even my fiance lives in a different state. You know, I had a couple of glasses of champagne and pizza, and I'm back in the usual diet tomorrow. Just oh, yeah. what he had put into getting to where he is. Well, I found interesting in that article, the piece that the thing that got to me and it stayed with me was that he was up at 6 a.m. the next morning for his whereabouts test because yeah. he wasn't about to miss. It. Mm -hmm. And that just showed it's the attention to detail. Uh, Tiana Bartoletta spoke to us about that a while back. And mm -hmm. um, when I asked her about the whereabouts test and she goes, look, she goes, I've got to travel the world for a dozen years on someone else's dime. If I have to tell people where I'm at for one hour a day, 365 days a year, I can handle it. And Grant Holloway's the same thing. But Josh, I just think, uh, exemplified that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. AW, Athletics Weekly, one of our favorite magazines, they thought that British Athletics would do about five to six medals. I believe yes. six. Yes. You guys scored 10. Yes. Of those medals. Which was the biggest surprise? I think Ben Patterson in the 800. Funnily enough, mm -hmm. I spoke to him for the first time this evening and found him a lovely person because he came second in our trials in that strange race, remember, where Max Bergen led and then just tripped a metre short of the line. So that got Patterson into the top two. But he didn't have yeah. the qualifying time, so having mm -hmm. got the top two in the in the in the championship, he had to go out and find a fast enough race to get himself the qualifying time, and he got the qualifying time. So from that basis, you'd say if he'd got to the final, that was a pretty good achievement. Sure. And so yeah. there has a great quote from him. He said, "Once I got in the final, I thought to myself, nobody cares who's fourth, fifth, or sixth." Unless I get a medal, I'll be forgotten. And so he just managed to get into third place and by sheer grit and determination, to quote Jeff, to quote uh, Joyce Kerr, he wanted it more than the yeah. other fellow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what Kerr said about how he held off Inga Britson. I sensed that I wanted it more than he did. Yeah, well, that's what it looked like. That last 100 metres... In that fifteen hundred, never forget because yeah. Yeah. it was about wills. Your relays, I, I find your relay philosophy really interesting, and I wish the U.S. would steal it because yeah. you medals in the mixed, you got medals in the men and women's four by four. Yes, you got medals in the women's four by one, fourth in the men's yes. uh, four by four, and I really think that fourth in the men's. Four by four was oh so close, yes. you know. Um, Funnily, I talked to Zarnell about that, and yeah. he yeah he said he was frustrated that he hadn't got third, but just 
I mean, I, I said to him, Stephen Maguire had said he was amazed you were able to run the relay. It was your seventh race. Uh, yeah. And he said, oh, the, the team dragged me on. I was just sorry I couldn't quite get there. Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. the reason it works is that people um, at the beginning of the season are selected for the relay squad and they're told, we're going to pay you to be in the relay squad. But when we say you're going to compete, if we say we're putting a team in the pen relays, you've got to be there. If we yeah, say yeah. we're going to Spain or somewhere hot for a relay camp for a week, you've got to be there. And most of our relay runners are not going to win an individual medal. And so yeah. they can see this as a way of, of, of getting, getting an Olympic or World Championship medal. And so they commit to that. And somehow the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I mean, you look at Asha Phillip, who has got an awesome collection of relay medals. She yeah. has never gone under 11 seconds and has never really threatened it. But she is just so consistent in getting out in the relay. Yeah. And, you know, I, th I think I told you, I won't name the individual, but one of the American uh, four by one women told me that she had taken the baton from the person who gave it to her in Doha three times in her life. Now, Amani Lantikov will have taken a baton from Asha Phillip literally a thousand times. Oh, yeah. Because they will drill them. They will drill them. They will have their signals. They will have their hand positions. Practice, practice, practice. We reckon that our four fastest runners are not as fast as the four Americans, not as fast as the four Jamaicans. But if we can make up half a second by doing our changeovers faster than the Americans or the Jamaicans, then we're in the we're in the game. Yeah, and that's, no, that's, that's uh, why we do this. And and the basis the basis for funding of sport in the UK is medals. Yeah, UK yeah. sport, which hands out the money, sometimes sets medal targets. And so that mm -hmm. if you look at the Olympics, they may say, "Well, look, athletics, we hit you down to get eight medals, and you only get six. Whereas swimming was down for five and they get seven. So next time we're giving more money to swimming and less money to athletics. Well, that's how in the U.S. too. You know, the USOPC, and that's the, the right now, it's a fascinating political deal because the USOPC, all they want USATF to focus on is bringing medals home. You know, there's 29 this time, yeah. 32 last yeah. time. Yeah. I was going to say that if you remember Charles von Comedy, Oh yeah, uh, our head coach. At one stage, he had he had the idea that since we weren't going to win any medals in the individual sprints, that we should not enter anyone in them, yeah. and that the the six athletes who went should know that they were going to win a relay medal, and so their entire focus would be on that, not uh, as for example with Noah Lyles. I have no doubt that for Noel Lyles, winning a relay medal was nice, but it was very much his third priority. Yeah. So that ours would actually be saying, look, you're not going to waste your time running in a prelim, knowing you're not really going to get through it, or you're certainly not going to get through the semi. So let's just go and say, right, you're here to win a relay medal. And from day one of the Olympics, that's your focus. That may seem a bit extreme, but there we are. No, I like Van Komeny. I stalked him around a few meets in Europe, and he came up to me and asked me what I was doing. And I said, I wanted to observe you, you know, because I was hanging out with a bunch of your coaches and some of the U.S. coaches, and I would just see him with the athletes and see him sitting in the stands watching people. I was at FPK and a, a few others. And this is just by happenstance. This is 2011, 2012. So I went up and introduced myself. And I said, I really admire how you do things. I wasn't sure he, he figured out how to take it, but I did like his approach. And I'll tell you what he's done with the Netherlands. My gosh, you know, pretty mm -hmm. incredible. Let's talk about Femke Bowl a little bit. And yes. let's give our mobile readers. Um, my feeling is, you know, and I'm an American, right? Uh, that's what they tell me. 
I don't think she gets the respect she deserves. There's all the Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni, and I love Sydney. Wonderful person. The interview I got to do with her in New York, if I got three of those a year, that would be amazing because I think she needs to talk more to the, the fans. But I'm not sure that she, uh, a thing move really right now, like track and field. And I hope they get to a place where they do again. But Femke yeah. seems to enjoy it. And she's always good. How is she in interviews with you? Great, great. I mean, I I, I have sort of got to know her a bit. I, I have had a, a long one-to-one with her. And uh, I've spoken to her in loads of uh, mix zones. I listened to her in the pressure today with, with a bit of fun because um, Mondo was talking a bit about the Belgian pole vaulter, Ben Brothers, yeah. who's yeah. a training mate of his. Is that her boyfriend? Who, ha- who happens to be Femke's boyfriend. <laughs> and so they were they were having a bit of fun talking about him. And mm-hmm. Mondo says, you know, there's all sorts of people. There are people who are fairly laid back and there are people who are on the other side of the spectrum who have to have every detail organized. Pause. Ben is rather on the everything must be organized side and (laughs) laughing and nodding. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. I love that. (laughs) The thing thing about Femke that we have to applaud is how often she runs. Yeah. And I mean, for example, the European teams, she went to that and ran a relay. And uh, she said, I'm not staying to do the individual because I need to get back to training. But she'd actually turned up because she said, I, I just love running with the Dutch team. So I want to come and run the relay. Yeah, I want to go to the European teams with you. That to be on the list the next couple of years. I, because one, there's a dearth of fans there and that event deserves to have more publicity. But two, it seems great chance to catch up with the athletes and the coaches. And that's one of the things I love. I felt, what did you think happened in the mixed relay? Did you just think she had overexerted herself? Um, I think she said it was just cramp and she she just couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was asked about it again today and she just said, you know, she felt awful because she'd let the team down. I thought though, uh, I, I took a picture of her that Kevin Morris had done. Just as she, right after she finished uh, the four by four, I thought it was such a glorious end to the meet. And so I wrote the agony and the ecstasy because she had been through it all. And then her teammate, Stefan Hassan, in 10,000, yeah. Yeah. coming back in the 1500 and then coming back in the 5,000. And yeah. now we hear that our lovely. Faith Kip Yagen, uh is now going to try and triple in Paris. She wants to win gold in the 510 and the 1500. And I think she could do it. Yeah. I think capable. I just get her a couple tens under her belt. And then at the Eastoff meet, uh, a tens of Ed Gaudet runs a 1408 solo. And I'm just kind of going, wow. That young woman is just got some wheels, you know. Yeah. But um, it was, it was. I want to take you back to the women's ten for a minute. In watching that race, Safan was going back and forth, weaving that last mm. fifty to hundred. And there were people, including me, that were like, "Wow, she kind of was impeding people." And then I had a, uh, a my brain stopped freezing, and I remembered the ten thousand in Eugene. Mm. <laughs> the tens of a today just kept Helen. Obiri from mm. getting past her, you know. I'm not sure that there's anything illegal about it or wrong about it. It's what happens in the height of a competition yeah. with yeah. such as on the line. What's mm. your thoughts? Very strange. I just don't know. Yeah. But I mean, the most incredible thing was that Hassan going to the ground and Ball going to the ground 10 minutes apart. Oh, it's, it, it, it must have been. I would love to hear what a a dutch tv reporter would have was saying about yeah. that i i, I yeah. search that out because i think that would be yeah. fascinating what did you think about mondo uh in his performance in you know we're spoiled with him because we've yeah. watched this young now what is it five world records yeah or perhaps six hmm. um 
I, I remember well, Jonathan. I remember Jonathan Edwards saying that there were days that he wished he had not jumped more than seventeen ninety nine because wow. because if he went out and jumped seventeen ninety something, which is a pretty good, yeah. people thought he had failed because he hadn't got yeah. over eighteen meters. And I wonder yeah. that if Mondo carries this pressure as well, that it's not enough for him to win. He's got to get over six meters every time. And now six meters is not enough. It has to be 610, 615. He's got to be trying 620. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Mondo today said that he's a very laid back guy and he doesn't really feel any pressure. And he was asked, are you more laid back than Usain Bolt? And he just said, I'm too young. I didn't really know him. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, Mondo, I had been on the same floor as Mondo and Amit Hotel, and he stopped to chat to me. He's you no, know, he is that kind of, there's no superstar about him. Uh, I don't think he's ever uh, refused to speak to me uh, in the mix zone. He just seems to be enjoying it, embraces the lifestyle, and is just comfortable with it. Um, and he doesn't ever seem to show any pressure. Yeah, yeah. He said some lovely things. He was asked about Sam Kendricks being back. And he said, well, I don't think he'd ever been away. I just think he'd had some bad luck and some things to deal with. Yeah. But just again, I mean, it's just so much respect for an opponent. No, I, I, I think that the pole vault, I remember being at Belt Casa in 17, and um, I got to interview Maria Lazenskane, uh, then Renault. It was one of the first times I got to meet Mondo and Sam. And I did a piece about the Sam, Mondo, and Renault show and how they had saved the Mobile. And I still believe that. And uh, But if they've saved the men's pole vault, Katie Moon has surely made the women's pole vault a glorious thing with some of the athletes around her and her competitions now with Nina Kennedy and Sandy Morris seems to be coming back. Yeah. Um, and your Molly, Molly had a nice PB, mm -hmm. uh, which surprised her, herself in the Budapest. That is our most popular story of Budapest. My friend, you got over in, in 24 hours, you had over 9.3 thousand readers of the story it's our biggest story of the year and i just think you really captured something about those athletes but also about the event what do you like about the women's pole vault until i met katie najat in an airport transit lounge i had never thought what life was like for pole vaulter when we arrived together in doha i worried that my suitcase might not have arrived she couldn't care less about her suitcase. Where were her poles? I never <laughs> thought about the difficulty of carrying mm -hmm. your poles. And of course, Katie has been such an honest person about her mental struggles. Uh, I think I think that's been great. But what amused me, and I did a little a little video for um, AW with her in Zurich, when somebody had called her a legend and. She said, no, 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 I'm not. And so I took her, took her up at that. I said, you know, you're the double world champion, Olympic champion. You're one of the greats of the sport. And she said, oh, I just don't feel comfortable with people saying that. I suppose I am in a way, but I don't feel comfortable with that. And again, there's this lovely disarming. And, in the, you know, when she says, most of my life, I had been scared of pole vaulting because it's a scary thing to do. Yeah. I mean that's a remarkable thing yeah. to actually say yeah. you're scared of what you what you do because if you get it wrong, you're suddenly um, six meters in the air, falling in the wrong direction. Oh yeah. I think one of my frustrations with pole vault is you can be at a meet and not actually see it. Yeah, yeah. That, I I don't think it's presented as no. well it, as it should be because I think that the gymnastics the yeah the aerial chess game that yeah. the vault is i mean hmm. two that explain it well katie's very good yeah 
and I need to start throwing questions to Katie like I do to Sam in Mondo, because mm. I'll get Mondo in 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 uh, L.A. Sam pulled this one off, where Mondo claims that he's never seen a guy be closer to his standards mm-hmm. ever in a competition, but because of Sam's veteran status, his ability, he was able to to orchestrate that. Mondo said he wouldn't even try it. And so I had them both explain it. Now, Sam is wonderfully clear and concise when he explains what's going on in the competition, you know? And it almost be fun to mic those guys, but after they've competed and get them to describe what went on. And I'm yeah. gonna have to that, you know. Uh, yeah. and I'd love but I'd love to Katie and Nina. Yeah. I just that the picture that I was able to find for the piece on the women's pole vault was spectacular. Because Katie had that, I'm not sure she knew anybody was taking a picture of her. She, it was just her, you know, the way we yeah. see her. I got to meet Sharika Jackson in line in Budapest. She was really getting annoyed trying to get on her plane. But I yeah. told her how much I enjoyed her and how wonderful yeah. she was in the thanked her. Mm. And she was fine. And, and uh, Noah's coach, Lance, gave me some trouble about it. And then I got to talk to Shakari. And I just said, Shakari, you know, you really did great in the champs, but you were wonderful in the media stuff. Um, are you allowing yourself to enjoy it yet? And she kind of smiled. She goes, a little bit. She still has to have feels, you know, yeah. it, it's, mm-hmm. they, as you know, you watch these athletes over a period of time and they see you 10, 12 times a year. So mm-hmm. they relax with you, you know, but yeah. the first couple of times yeah. they see you mm-hmm. and they talk to you, they don't know what they're going to get, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I had a um, had a reporter from Reuters come up to me and give me a backhanded compliment. He told me that when I do the pressers, he th- thinks that a lot of my jokes are really or my questions are really simplistic. He said, but now he understands the method to the madness mm-hmm. that I'm trying to give these people room to communicate after they've cheated, right? And you know, in the mix zone, these kids are still breathing hard, you know. Yeah. And it's do you find sometimes that you have to change your mode of questioning with an athlete right after a competition? Yes, and I mean, because because I do this because I want to do it. Equally, yeah. I understand if an athlete actually feels the emotion is too much to speak at that moment. I mean, I understand people who have been under pressure from their employer to get the story and therefore really have almost got to try and force the athlete to talk. But, you know, I, I have said to an athlete, look, if you just want to leave it for tonight, that's fine by me. Because it, it, it is, it's a unique thing, I think, in, in this sport that you have just had a public disaster And you can't just go away and process it. You have to come and face live television. And then, in some cases, fairly cynical writers. And in some cases, writers who really have very little understanding of the sport. Because the dedicated athletics writer in British newspapers is gone. So you're getting a question from somebody who was doing tennis last week, soccer the week before be doing cycling next week and are doing athletics this week. And I don't really actually understand what's happened. I mean, for example, there's some British writer wrote about Laura Muir winning in Zurich that she had, um, it was good to see her running well after she'd run so badly in in Budapest. Well, my God. Oh, my God. If that person had actually been in Budapest, had spoken to Laura, he would actually have felt heard Laura say that she didn't think she ran badly. She thought that the way the race developed was not the way she had wanted it to develop. And had it been a faster race, it would probably have suited her better. But yeah. you know, that's the kind of thing that that I think the athletes, particularly young, inexperienced athletes, have to learn to deal with. Well, when you think about it, you're talking about global riders. I, I look at Jason Henderson, Tim mm-hmm. Wayson, and uh, Ewan at Athletics Weekly, Sig Lindstrom, 
at uh, track and field news, what you and I do, you know, our, our associates, Deji and Justin, and there's very few people out there and more, um, uh, Mike Robottom. Um, yeah. There's a small group, probably a dozen now around the world. Who yes. Do, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I think you wrote 170 articles for us this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. I went back. I've edited now twenty two thousand five hundred articles on one blog run. Nothing has ever been put up without my editing or approval. And I pick yeah. all the photos, and yeah. we do that. And we and we because one we love the sport, but also because we stand by what we say, and we take the responsibility of communicating with these kids, these young, and, you know, I call everybody under 40 kids. I'm sorry. And um, so, and I was teasing somebody the other day about that. I said, yeah, I said, yeah, I'm going to call you a kid until you hit about 40. So just get used. But um, we do it with affection. You know, I think we can still write our frustration sometimes. I mean, you and I had, we agreed to disagree about the British selection process, but the truth is, it it sure as hell worked this time because yeah, wow, it was ten, you know, to tell you know Jack and Stephen and the crew, and I I will put a note up about it mm-hmm. that yeah, much as I gave them some guff, I got to respect what they did, and it means yeah. a lot. Uh, and 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 it's a uh, there's a lot of pressure in this high stakes uh, uh, thing. I want to go to one last question because I know you need to sleep tonight. And we've now gone about 50 minutes. And Michael, you know, his lovely wife is waiting for him for dinner in Indy right now. Seb Co was elected 192 to zero. Uh, this will be his last go round, his yes. world athletic chief. Yeah. I suspect that he's going to run, put his hat in the ring for the head of the IOC. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you, Any observations? Where are you at with that right now? I have no information on it, but I think your supposition is probably correct. Yeah. One, um, I, I, had you... a, I spent an hour with a group of people listening to him in Zurich, and something I found really interesting, he said that while Budapest was his third world championship as president, it was the first that he was responsible for, because the other two had been in in the pipeline. And that one of the things that he had said to Budapest was, I can forgive most things, but not empty seats. So you've got yeah. to make sure. And obviously, I'd be interested to know what he would have done with, say, Doha, yeah. Beijing, yeah. Moscow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if that's going to be one of his criteria for the future, then, you know, I think that people with a lot of money uh, who want the prestige of holding the event uh, won't get it unless he's convinced that they can deliver. Yeah. Well, it's because more and more, the only way athletics is going to get the money that they need, that we need to grow, is yeah. through television revenues. Yeah. And there are rumors that this new group of events and new system that he's going to do in 2026, there are some events left in the wayside. It may shake, I believe it's going to shake up track and field like cricket was shaken up over the last five or six years yeah. with some of the new things going yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it needs to be done, but I'm terribly terribly concerned about some of our field events Mm. that have incredible passion and incredible tension Mm. and are great on tv long jump i mean tengadalu winning all these events yeah yeah Yeah. you know um krauser and and ely in the shot put yeah pole vault and and ely ely said to me tonight that yeah. she loves the street meet because it's the only time we are center stage. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, the first time I saw the shot put to center stage was with the late Paul Banta at the Adidas Oregon meet back in the mid, uh, mm. early 90s. And uh, what he would do is two hours before the meet, 
just a shot. And it was Nelson and Godina and I mean, these monsters out there and at Lewis and Clark College. And it was like, wow, he got it. And, and, and I just and then I remember Bob Fraley, the coach at Fresno, doing street pole vault. And he would do it in downtown Fresno and he would fix it up and there was money poured into it and stuff like that. And you just kind of went, could these things really happen? You know, and in Germany, they've been doing these high jump single event things. And I know our friend Alphonse Juch does. So one of my dreams is, is to traipse around Central Europe going to his high jump events one you know, winter because yeah. he does such a great job. Stuart, you've survived uh, a record of 57 minutes with me today, my friend. And it is so great seeing you. I'm sorry we didn't get to spend more time in Budapest. Um, but enjoy Brussels tomorrow. I'm going to yep. get your stories up now. And then enjoy your lovely vacation. And I will enjoy mine. And uh, thank you again for okay. this wonderful. Good. All right, friends. Thank you. This is Chat 105. Have a great afternoon. Run, jump, and throw. And keep reading stories on run blog run talk to you soon hey sports fans larry eater here this is athletics chat 105 our epilogue uh stuart weir is in brussels for the alliance memorial von damme meet the meet is in honor of Ewo von damme who was belgian's steve prefontaine uh from the same era too um he survived prefontaine by about a year in 1976 in montreal Ewo von damme took the silver in the 800, passing Rick Wolhuter, the man who was supposed to win the 800, finishing right behind uh, Alberto Juan who had just who won the 800, El Caballo, the Cuban, who also won the 400 later. In the 1500 against John Walker, world record holder in the mile, and the man with the second best 1500 at the time, he again finished second. And the 800, 1500, that was just incredible. And 1980 should have been his big time. He was unfortunately killed in an auto accident in December of 76, coming back from a training camp. The Belgian athletic community was crushed. He was extremely popular, a lovely man, according to his contemporaries, some of my friends. So this meet came about. And each year it's gotten better. In the 80s, it was one of the places where you'd see Mark Ninau and Seda Wida bang it in for 25 laps in a 10,000. Carlos Lopes and Fernando Mohamed in, in uh, running great times there. Great miles, 5,000s. It was a brilliant meet. Uh, when I got to go there from 2007 on, it was one of my favorites, a great way to end the season. I loved the hotel that they had, that they kept the place uh, where they had the headquarters because right across the street was a Belgian Vietnamese pho soup place and I can live on pho soup and um, it's the Vietnamese soup but I know I'm mispronouncing it and the kids would crack up when I would come in because I'd come in like at two o'clock in the morning and they'd be open till four and I'd get a big bowl of soup and then go back to my room and you know now fall asleep contentedly but uh, the meat was wonderful in King Badawan Stadium uh, they've just redone the track there, so it should be wonderful. But the pressers at the meet, the Brussels meet, and the pressers at the Zurich Weltklasse are two of my favorites. I have to tell you, my favorite presser all times is Paris. The announcer there does the interviews in French and English, and I get a chance to ask a half dozen questions with each group, and I remember three in particular Mutaz uh, Barshim, and that was a wonderful one. But also, oh gosh, some great ones with the great pole vaulters and some fun ones on the hurdle scene too. But it, Paris just had a way about it, whether it was the uh, Stade de France uh, or then when it moved to the Stade Charlotte in what, 16, 17. And I'm looking forward to Paris next year for the Olympics. That'll be my 10th Summer Olympics that I've covered. Um, I think seventh that I have attended. So uh, I, it, it should be a lot of fun. Paris is an incredible track town. One of my dreams is to go over in February and just hit all the indoor track meets for a month all over Paris uh, and, and all over France, which is uh, they have a 
extensive indoor season. And that'll be another tour to Larry that we'll have to talk with everybody about. But being with Stuart today, we normally do our podcast at about 35 to 40 minutes. And this time we went well over an hour. Stuart is a dear friend. He's been with us now for 10 years. And it began on a walk in Manchester for the city games. And I really liked the way Stuart comported himself and spoke lovingly about the athletes. And he does something that many of you don't know about. Um, He is a minister, a Christian minister, and he provides non-denominational religious services for athletes as they travel. And he's developed a lovely relationship with athletes from all over the world. And he is a unique person. He loves what he does. And it obviously comes out in his articles and his affection for our athletes. I think it's one of the things that makes us different is the group of writers that we have all over the world. And their affection and concern for the sport um, means a lot to me and means a lot to, I believe, the sport. And that's exemplified by our readership right now. Two weeks before the world champs, we were getting about 552,000 readers a day. We're now a little over 4.25 million a day. It's in an age group that's really, uh, the average age is 26, 27. It's about 65% male. I really want to get more women reading our articles. And we have readers all over the world. And we appreciate what you do by taking the time to read our pieces and comment. And that means a lot. There's just under 23,000 pieces on Run Blog Run. I've edited every one of them and approved every photo. So if the buck stops anywhere, it stops with me to take uh, the quote from um, our um, illustrious president of the U.S., um, Harry Truman. Uh, He's from the same state that I am, uh, Missouri. And uh, so thank you again for checking out Run Blog Run. Thank you for supporting Athletics Chat, which uh, started back in 2020 as the thought process of Mike Deering and my son, Adam Eater, Johnson Eater. And um, they wanted to help me continue to communicate with our readership when I wasn't able to travel and I needed to, to chat. So they came up with the idea of talking with Stuart once a week. We're now on our 105th program, and we want to continue doing this. And send us a note at runblogrun at gmail.com and tell us what you think. But thank you again. Have a great afternoon. This is Athletics Chat 105. This is the epilogue. It is uh, September 7th, 2023. Talk to you soon.